Cruz Maguad woke up on the 10th of December 2021 and thought it was going to be a normal day. It was a Friday, the end of another week, teaching at the Mariano Untal Memorial High School and then fixing some structures in Buayan Elementary School where his wife Lovella worked as its principal. The country and the world were still very much in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic, but Cruz, like many of us, had gotten used to living with the virus. He was just thankful that the Christmas break was fast approaching, allowing him to spend more time with his family. However, little did he and Lovella know at that time that life as they knew it would change around three in the afternoon that day. Little did they know that Christmas that year would be less of a celebration of the birth of Jesus, but a day they'd rather not celebrate at all. And little did they know that betrayal can add insult to injury like no one else could. This is the case of the Maguad siblings. Mabuhay, my name is Christine and welcome to Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. Every two weeks, I publish Filipino true crime stories that you can listen to and download on and from any of your preferred podcasting platforms. If you want to support this podcast, make sure to stay until the end of this episode to hear about all the many ways you can show your support for me and the podcast. As always, please note that details in the story can be triggering for some people as there will be mention of death, blood, and injuries. So please take care of yourself whilst listening. When I first heard about this case, it was around three days after the crime took place. People were up in arms that it was not getting enough publicity and time on the airwaves as well, so Twitter did its usual thing and blew it up. When mainstream media finally paid attention, the internet was already saturated with gruesome photos and all sorts of rumors. I had to sift through the many odd blogs, opinion pieces, badly written articles by obscure online news outlets and some very dramatic YouTube videos to get to what we really know so far about the case. Obviously, the case is still ongoing and any updates will be on the game's social media once they become available. Needless to say, this story is, despite it only being recent, already bonkers. For lack of a better term, really. I can see why people felt drawn to the story, but before we get into all that, here is what we know so far. On the 10th of December at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, siblings Crizel Gwen Maguad, 18 years old, and Crizel Luis Maguad, 16 years old, were at home in Barangay Baguntapay, Poroc San Isidro in Mlang, North Cotabato. Since the names of both siblings sound almost identical, I will call them Gwen and Luis from here on out, for clarity's sake. Their parents, Cruz and Lovella, were at work and were due to go back home in the next couple of hours. The siblings were not alone, however. With them was Christine, the family's adopted daughter, who first arrived at their home some five months ago. Christine was an alias given to the girl by most media outlets to protect her identity since she's still a minor. Although some articles have published her true name, I am sticking to Christine for this episode. The Maguad siblings, by all accounts, were good kids. Both did well in school and were described as sweet, loving, and passionate people. It seems from social media postings by various people who may have known the teenagers that both enjoyed a good and close-knit relationship with their parents. 
Reports later would show that it was this goodness in the siblings, especially in 18-year-old Gwen, that led to the adoption of Christine. Gwen advocated and pleaded for her in front of her parents to let Christine stay at their home. Christine is a relative of the Maguads, and from what the Maguads knew, she was orphaned. Christine since then was welcomed into the fold and was given food, shelter, and the chance to finish her schooling. The Maguad siblings made sure that Christine felt welcomed and created space for her to make her feel more at home. It is my understanding that Louis gave up his room so Christine can have her own room, but in some reports, it seemed like Gwen and Christine did share a room together, which would have allowed them to bond like sisters. By the time Christine had settled into the Maguad home, not much was really known about her stay there. It did not seem like any red flags were raised during that time. However, all of that was about to change. The following account of what happened was the immediate statement made by Christine right after the events of the 10th of December, 2021. According to Christine, at around three in the afternoon, three unidentified men forcefully entered the Maguad home and attacked Louis first. He was being beaten and stabbed when Gwen and Christine happened upon the horrible scene. Both girls pleaded with the attackers to stop, but instead they turned their attention to the girls. The attackers got hold of Gwen, but Christine was able to get away because she ran to a small room within the home and locked herself up. She then hid herself under a bed. There, she proceeded to ask for help through social media, where she posted two Facebook statuses informing the public that someone had broken into their home. When she reckoned the attack was over, she came out and found a horrifying scene. Both Maguad siblings were lying in pools of their own blood. It seemed to Christine that both were either bludgeoned or hacked to death, or both. As I understand it, the attack inside the Maguad home did not go entirely unnoticed amongst those who lived nearby. I can only surmise that Christine's Facebook posts also helped in letting other people know that something awful just happened. In any case, someone had ended up contacting Cruz Maguad whilst he was still working. He received a call and was told that his home was just ransacked. He needed to go home immediately. By 3.15 in the afternoon, he reached his home. Before he could even enter the house, he noticed a blood-soaked blanket and a knife outside the main door. He started to call out for his son, whose nickname was Boy Boy. He went to the back of the house and used the door there instead of the main one, which was locked. After he entered and as he reached the living room, he stumbled upon the same horrifying sight that Christine described in her initial statement. Cruz Maguad would later share with the media that he found Gwen with multiple bruises and wounds all over her body. Just a couple of steps from her was Louis, who was hogtied and gagged near the main door of the house, also having sustained fatal injuries. Cruz then looked for Christine, who he was not sure had survived this heinous attack on his family. And this is where we have to switch to Cruz's account of the events and his perspective because his conversation with Christine would prove crucial in furthering the investigation into this case. Cruz recalled later that he went to look for Christine and at the same time she also happened to exit the room that she was hiding in. She looked terrified but her hair was wet. She seemed to have taken a shower before Cruz arrived. Christine told Cruz about what happened, and eventually the local police authorities were called in. 
Now, these were the initial assessments made by the police upon inspecting the crime scene and the subsequent observations made a few days into their investigation. Firstly, the police noticed that things in the house were a bit topsy-turvy with some cabinets being left open and personal belongings scattered about. Robbery was therefore a motive that the police were planning to look into. In order to confirm this motive, they would need to check if anything was missing at all from the house. Furthermore, the police were also not excluding the parents as persons of interest in this case as a matter of procedure, leading them to check if both mother and father were really at work during the time of the crime. The police also reported that the room in which Christine said she hid herself was rather messy. At first glance, this was nothing to be alarmed about since robbery was, as I said, a potential motive and finding the crime scene messy was normal, if not expected. But there was one little problem. Christine said that she locked herself in that room as soon as the attacks started and hid herself under the bed, meaning the unidentified assailants would not have had any access to that room to potentially rob it or at the very least create any kind of mess. It is of course possible that the room was already messy before the attacks, the kind of mess that teenagers perhaps create. Another possibility for the lack of a mess in that specific room was perhaps the fact that Christine may have locked herself in, hid under the bed, after which the assailants did manage to break into the room, ransack it, and then left without having found her. However, that did not align with her statement. Now, despite this odd detail looking like an inconsistency the longer the police looked at it, they did not end up putting too much stock in it. Well, at least for now. The police were then informed by Lovella Maguad that Christine texted her around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but when Lovella tried to call back, immediately Christine did not pick up. As for the siblings and their injuries, Malang Municipal Police Chief Mamon reckoned that whoever attacked the siblings had a lot of hate for them, implying that it might have been a crime of passion something that is mostly perpetrated by a person that is close to a victim or victims. The bodies were sent for autopsy, and according to police authorities, it took two days to ascertain the number of injuries both siblings had sustained, implying that there were too many, which all needed to be documented. The injuries, both results of stabbing and beating, were consistent with objects that were found near the bodies when the police made their initial sweep of the scene. Specifically, they found pieces of broken bottles, a hammer, a knife, and a baseball bat. Immediately, the police inquired about these weapons, and Cruz Maguad explained that the hammer was his but that this was hidden in the family's laundry room, something that only three people knew about. Only Gwen, Cruz, and Christine knew where the hammer was hidden. Cruz further explained in reference to the baseball bat that his son owned the bat and that it was placed on the second deck of a double bed where Christine slept. This too raised suspicions eventually because it would either mean that the attackers had access to that room with a bat before attacking the siblings. It is unclear to me at this point whether Christine hid in the same room the bat was in, but if that had been the case, then the police would have had good reason to ask Christine again about how the attack transpired on the 10th as it seemed inconsistent yet again with what she had told Cruz and the police just days ago. In any case, the police widened their search to the surrounding areas in Poroxat Isidro, 
and it was then that the crime scene officers found a pair of trousers and blood-stained underwear in a plastic bag near an irrigation canal. It was then presumed that the assailants were drenched with the siblings' blood and managed to wash off this blood before changing clothes to avoid detection. As the media coverage of the case picked up pace, some government officials weighed in on the matter and also offered rewards for anyone who could lead the police to the assailants in this case. Vice Mayor Joselito Peñol of the Municipal Council of Malang in North Cotabato offered a 200,000 peso reward, whilst Mayor Pip Limbungan of Tulunan offered a 50,000 peso bounty for the arrest of the suspects. As for the investigation, it seemed that two or three days into the investigation, the police could not conclusively establish robbery as a motive because it did not seem like anything was actually missing from the house. This was something that the police probably did not expect and would theoretically force them to pursue other lines of inquiry. The investigation was actually headed by a special task group, and from what the media reported at that time, it seemed that there was a mandate to deal with this case as quickly as possible. It was this special task group that informed the media three days after the Maguad siblings were so brutally murdered that Christine had now been given to the custody of the Municipal Welfare Office. On the same day, Mlang Vice Mayor Pignol also announced that he had requested the National Bureau of Investigation to assist in the investigation indicating again that this case was taken very seriously, which, to be honest, was a refreshing stance to read about as a true crime podcaster. But then again, a small part of me, the cynical part, is thinking that maybe this was done just for publicity's sake, to have the politicians endear themselves to their voters, or maybe this is just something that happens in the beginning of any case, but then dies out as time goes by, like in the Zhang Lucero case, which I covered in season one. In any case, the investigation continued. Whilst something else was brewing online, thanks to netizens with an imaginative streak, for lack of a better term. By the 14th of December, a few articles and blog posts made the rounds comparing the case to the movie The Orphan. I could not quite trace back where all this started, but one post that was significant in helping give rise to this movie comparison pointed out what the poster called loopholes in Christine's statements, some of which I have already mentioned and or alluded to earlier in this episode. The post was written in Bisaya originally and purported to know a few things that were not really published anywhere else, let alone by the major, more trusted news outlets in the Philippines. It isn't clear whether the poster of this conspiracy theory or theories knew something we did not or merely speculated to make their theory fit their conclusion. I will make sure to attach a screenshot of this post in the blog and a Tagalog translated version of it as well. So make sure you check Lagim's Instagram bio for that. Anyway. The most jarring revelations of this post are the following. Christine, in her first month of stay with the Maguads, apparently stole 10,000 pesos but gave it back after being confronted. Gwen pleaded with her parents to forgive Christine and apparently the parents agreed with Gwen and life went on. Also, apparently, after Christine posted her Facebook plea for help on the 10th of December, Gwen's boyfriend called her right away. Christine, as I understood it, did not say anything after picking up, and no commotion could be heard in the background either. 
this specific point seemed to imply that either the attack had already finished and Christine was merely faking it for Facebook. Now on to the next point. According to the post, when Cruz Maguad arrived, he apparently noticed that Gwen's blood was already drying up and ants were already starting to gather around her stiff body. Only Luis's body looked as if the killing had just happened, with rigor mortis not having set in for that long, raising further questions as to when the killing actually began. On to the next point, and this time it's about Christine's fingerprints. Apparently, Christine's fingerprints were found on the baseball bat, which honestly should not be controversial since the whole family could have held on to that bat at some point or another. Lastly, in that post, it was pointed out that apparently Christine suddenly started calling Cruz and Lovella Papa and Mama after the death of the Maguad siblings, which struck them as odd. I think it was this last point that made Filipino netizens go berserk and compared Christine to the main protagonist and antagonist in the movie The Orphan, in which an adopted girl who seemed younger than her actual age ended up not only seducing the family's patriarch, but also planning the family's murder. People drew comparisons because Christine was reported to have been an orphan as well. And she was also adopted by a family whose children are now dead. The rumors did not bypass the police investigation either. They most probably had their doubts about Christine already, but also could not ignore the kind of information coming out of the internet. It is difficult to strike a balance as a local authority with a duty to investigate crimes, to listen and heed only good airtight evidence and rumors in the community that may provide extra insight or more. Needless to say, Christine had become a person of interest at this point on top of being a witness and a survivor. Eagle-eyed netizens also unearthed a Facebook post and picture of allegedly a young Christine who either was abandoned by her parents or had gone missing when she was just eight years old. If the child in this photo was Christine, then I have so many questions like, was she then returned to her parents? Were they even found? Did they really abandon her? And how does this align with the narrative that Christine was an orphan. Pending the answers to these questions, the special task group told the public on the 15th of December that they were still awaiting lab results of the forensic evidence they have sent off for testing. Only after receiving the results would they file a formal complaint. The police disclosed that the evidence sent to the crime lab included blood samples the weapons, hair strands, and fingerprints. It was also added that statements by witnesses had all been gathered and being prepared for the filing of the complaint. The police, when it came to Christine, kept their cards close to their chest, only repeating what they said about her being a person of interest and also adding that her statement was vital to the investigation. Nothing more, nothing less. By the 16th of December, the police and the public were still waiting for any new development in the case. In the meantime, some individuals on the internet thought it was a good idea to post pictures and videos of the Maguad siblings' dead bodies, an act utterly despicable if I ever saw one. Calls were made to refrain from spreading and sharing these images to protect the dignity of the deceased siblings. Additionally, the public would learn that the evidence found near the irrigation canal, remember the bloodstained underwear and trousers, were actually materials that had found themselves in the Maguad's laundry room before they were disposed of. 
It looked to the police like the perpetrators had washed themselves in the Maguad home before bagging the bloodied clothes and carrying them outside for disposal. The police hypothesized that the perpetrator's plan to let the evidence be carried away by the canal's current was thwarted when the bag got caught in a branch that was blocking its way. But all that information seemed to have gone from one ear and out the other because on the same day, the 16th of December, a bombshell would be dropped onto the Filipinos. Six days into the investigation, the media broke the news that Christine, the Maguad's adopted daughter and sole survivor of the attack, had apparently confessed to the killing of Gwen and Luis, together with two other people, one of whom is her boyfriend. If reports are to be believed, Christine, in the presence of a lawyer, confessed that she was motivated by anger and jealousy, which drove her to plan and also participate in the killing of the very people who took her in. According to other reports from the same day, one of the two people who helped Christine murder Gwen and Louise was a minor as well meaning that when he was apprehended, he too was brought into the custody of social welfare authorities. This news shook the nation and sent the conspiracy theorists into a frenzy since they felt vindicated about them comparing this case to the movie The Orphan. Meanwhile, Cruz Maguad, who was interviewed after this development was made public, said the following as translated into English from Filipino. Quote, She was jealous and insecure. That's why she was very angry with Krizel. She wanted to take her place. I have heard that is her personality. When she's angry at someone, she will really take down that person. End of quote. As if this bombshell of a noose was not enough, The police also revealed that Christine was not an orphan at all. As it turns out, her parents are very much alive, as well as Christine's three siblings. Some bloggers have written all sorts of things in the aftermath of this revelation, and I just want to preface this next part by saying that I could not find other sources that confirmed this piece of information. According to one blog post, Christine was a movie fan, and one of her favorites was, yes, you guessed it, The Orphan. According to the same blog post, Mr. Maguad had apparently confirmed that Christine had introduced the movie to him, but he refused to watch it. He told her he had already watched the movie and he did not like it. This confirmed to the conspiracy theorists and blog posters out there that Christine was acting out the plot of The Orphan. Now, let me be the first one to admit that reading these conspiracy theories and these blog posts has been quite the roller coaster and certainly was very interesting, but I am more interested in the question as to how Christine managed to pass herself off as an orphan and where her parents were all this time. These are just a few questions that I hope will get answered as soon as we get more details about this case. Whether the movie plot theory is true or not, I still am flabbergasted by the tumbles and turns this case has managed to take us through in the space of less than a week. I am inclined to disbelieve the movie plot theory for now, but I can see why it would be an interesting thing that people want it to be true. Many might say that it is a movie script writing itself, essentially. Now, whilst both Christine and the other suspect had long been in custody, 
the third assailant is still or at that time was still on the run. Remember that according to Christine, this person is her boyfriend. And so the police continued their search. In the meantime, the Maguad siblings were laid to rest on the 20th of December in Barangay Tawan-Tawan after Holy Mass was offered at the Santa Teresa de Jesus Parish. Emotions ran high in Cruz and Lovella, who seemingly did not want to let their children go. I can only imagine the heartbreak of having to bury your children, something that no parent should ever go through. Following the burial of the siblings, Cruz and Lovella made it known more than once that they are not in favor of what is known as Republic Act 9344, a piece of legislation that, according to Section 6, puts the minimum age of criminal responsibility at 15 years old. Anyone who is 15 or under cannot be charged in court and they cannot be considered as criminals. They are called children in conflict instead and shall be subjected to an intervention program pursuant to the same law. Christine at the commission of the crime was still 15 years old and would therefore come under this very law. Section 7 of this law provides that a child in conflict shall enjoy the presumption of minority. He, she, or they shall enjoy all the rights of a child in conflict with the law until he, she, or they are proven to be 18 years old or older. This just did not sit right with the Maguads, who are in favor of lowering the age of criminal responsibility. The Maguads also took issue with at least one celebrity who in the past advocated for the full and proper implementation of RA 9344. Anne Curtis Smith in 2019 posted a photo on Instagram with a caption expressing her support for the law. This somehow surfaced after the Maguad siblings were murdered, causing both Cruz and Lovella to accuse Curtis Smith of not being in touch with reality and not fully understanding that children 15 or under are still capable of being manipulative and dangerous. So here's the thing, and I do offer these thoughts with the utmost respect to the Maguad family. I know they are hurting and I respect their opinions, especially as they are coming from a place of deep and profound hurt. I also want to say that I absolutely do not condone what Christine and her partners in crime did. They deserve to answer to the law, but not like criminal adults do. There are good and legitimate reasons why we cannot treat most juvenile offenders as adult criminals. Firstly, the younger a child goes into the prison system, the higher is the likelihood that they will re-offend once they are released. This is called the criminogenic effect. Secondly, children from poor families, indigenous backgrounds, or other minorities are going to be disproportionately affected by any measure to lower the age of criminal responsibility as they will not have the means and connections to fight a criminal case. Next, juvenile criminality should be treated as a public health issue and not a criminal one, meaning the focus should be less about punishment but more on rehabilitation, resocialization, mental health therapy, empowerment, and opportunities for social mobility. Furthermore, studies have shown that lowering the age of criminal responsibility has no deterrent effect, which somewhat goes back to the issue of reoffending, but also to the issue of new offenders. The thought of the possibility of being charged as an adult did not really instill in most minors the kind of fear that some lawmakers in some countries may have thought of. This was, at the very least, the findings of researchers in Denmark. 
Lastly, whilst victims' families may feel a sense of revenge by seeing a juvenile criminal go to prison, I believe that treating most children as criminal adults is in and of itself an act of violence. Let me get off my soapbox for now and leave you with this quote from UNICEF instead. Quote, Detaining children will not teach them accountability for their actions. In order to maximize their potential to contribute to nation building, children must grow up in a caring, nurturing, and protective environment. This requires strong parenting support programs and access to health, education, and social services, as well as child-sensitive justice and social welfare systems. End of quote. The Maguad case is far from over. As we welcomed the new year, Luvela Maguad posted on her Facebook that an altar boy is being suspected as being part of the Maguad siblings' murder. The news outlets who reported on Luvela's post also added that either this altar boy or the other one who is already in the custody of social welfare authorities has actually been in and out of this welfare system. They received psychosocial interventions and other care measures from them, and it seems implied that the social care and welfare system might not have been as effective as hoped since either the altar boy or the other minor ended up killing people. Lavella Maguad also expressed frustration in not really knowing how the crime took place in her home and how her children were killed. No affidavits or statements were disclosed to Lovella or Cruz, so both grieving parents are still very much in the dark about a lot of things. This seems cruel and unfair, but not all too surprising coming from our national police authorities. Cruz Maguad, on the other hand, also posts updates now and then on Facebook. In one post, he claimed that one of the boys' fathers may have been the mastermind of the siblings' murders. It is not clear what the basis of this claim is. By the 6th of January, the public was yet again greeted by a bizarre update on this case. Christine's alleged biological mother had made an appearance at the burial site of both Gwen and Louis. Lovella and Cruz were visiting as well, and it was here that Christine's mother broke down in tears, knelt down in front of the Maguads, and asked for their forgiveness. Both Cruz and Lovella were reported to have been gracious towards the woman who promised to cooperate in the investigation any way she can. Christine's mother, as of the 6th of January, had still not been allowed to see her daughter, who remains in custody of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, or DSWD. The Maguads still believe that despite this, Christine's mother could provide vital insight into who Christine was and is and what could have led to her behavior that left the Maguads without their own children. As it stands, the investigation is still very much active. There are still so many unanswered questions. I found the sources I have used sometimes contradictory, but they were the best I could find for now. I am sure that at some point I may have to issue a correction for any of the details I have included here, as I am sure we are still going to learn more about this case. I hope that justice for Gwen and Lewis is not out of reach, and I equally hope that the suspects get a fair shot in a trial or otherwise. I hope they get the support they need because I have a feeling that we are also dealing with minors here with lots of trauma that shaped their actions and behavior as they grew older. It is not by any means an excuse, but it deserves to be looked into. For now, I offer my deepest condolences to the Maguads, whose loss cannot ever be remedied or replaced. 
Only time can tell how this loss can be mitigated, but from personal experience, I have to say that the loss of a loved one never really leaves you. It might dull over time, but it's always there. One just learns to live with it the best way one can. Lagim fam, thank you again for listening and thank you for the many people who requested this case. If you like my podcast, you can support it by subscribing to my Patreon feed where you can have some lovely perks depending on the tier you choose. You can also make one-off donations through buymecoffee.com. All links are in the show notes. Lastly, make sure to follow me on Instagram and other social media outlets like TikTok or Facebook. You can also follow, rate, and review La Game on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. All of these things really help the podcast reach more listeners. All the links to these platforms are in the show notes. Sources used for this episode can be found in La Game's blog, and please check the show notes for the link to the blog as well. Thank you again for all your support, and thank you for listening. Maraming salamat at mabuhay.